part of South America, a vast wild expanse. The world's largest wetland. But this is no ordinary swamp. Every year, it's drowned by immense floods. Then parched by severe drought. Yet while people struggle to cope, the Pantanal hosts some of the greatest gatherings of animals on the planet. It's the only place on the continent to rival Africa for its spectacular wildlife. A land of extremes that produces a profusion of life. Early explorers thought it was a vast inland sea. In reality, the Pantanal is a huge inland delta. Its name means swamp. But this is a place with two distinct personalities. For six months, it's wet, with up to 80% submerged by floods. The rest of the year, it's dry. With little rain and soaring temperatures, the floodwaters drop and the Pantanal reverts to parched savanna. At the very center of South America, the Pantanal is a giant basin the size of Britain. The vast majority lies in Brazil, the rest in Bolivia and Paraguay. The Pantanal starts where the continent's central plateau comes to a halt. The plateau drops into a series of canyons. The bridal veil falls, plunge 80 meters off the edge. It's September, midway through the dry season, and there's barely enough water to reach the bottom. White-eyed parakeets have spent the night roosting in the sandstone walls. They're preparing for a long day in the dusty surrounds and queue for an invigorating shower, one couple at a time. While the parakeets freshen up, larger relatives gather above them. Like most parrots, blue-winged macaws pair for life. What seems like squabbling is their way of cementing their bond before they fly off to forage. A pair of red and green macaws shares the canyon. Among the heaviest parrots in the world, they need plenty of food. Their long, narrow wings will power them on a 100-kilometer round trip to find it. Many of the streams and rivers that carve through central Brazil find their way here, before tumbling into the Pantanal below. A giant patchwork of forests, savannas and swamps tilts gently south. So its northern reaches are the first to dry out.
Shrinking pools provide little protection for the region's water-loving reptiles. And vulnerable wildlife is an irresistible lure to large predators. This is the Jaguar's kingdom. At over 100 kilograms, it's one of the heaviest cats in the world. Only tigers and lions are bigger. Its name means the beast that kills in one bound. And at this time of year, its prey seems well within range. But Cayman know just how to evade them. The jaguar will have plenty more opportunities. Abundant caiman are just one reason why the Pantanal's jaguars are twice the size of jaguars elsewhere in Latin America. Europeans first came to the Pantanal in search of gold. Failing to find El Dorado, they settled on farming. Now, 95% of the Pantanal is owned by ranchers. Up to 8 million cattle graze here. There's high demand from fast food restaurants across the world. In parts of the Pantanal, cattle make up a third of the jaguar's prey, fueling the predator's growth. Come nightfall, Sebastião can only hope his animals are the lucky ones. The cowboys and their cattle have changed the face of the Pantanal. To make space for grazing, trees are removed. But the cattle's presence has unexpected benefits for other animals. One is the hyacinth macaw. The largest parrot on the planet. It feeds almost exclusively on palm nuts. And it prefers those whose husks have already been digested by cattle. Even dehusked, these are particularly hard nuts to crack. So hard that a third of all the hyacinth mussels are concentrated in its head to power its monstrous mandibles. But brute strength is not enough. As well as its beak, the highly intelligent parrot uses its hand-like feet, dexterous tongue, and awesome brain power to eke out the nutritious kernels hidden inside. Three quarters of all hyacinth macaws live in the Pantanal. They thrive only where there are plenty of palm nuts and plenty of cattle to help prepare them. Every cattle pasture has a water hole. As the dry season tightens its grip, strange noises emanate from within. Cayman are forced together in these dwindling pools. Being so tightly packed provokes primal instincts. The grunt of a single female sparks the chorus. The males respond with infrasonic booms, powerful enough to make the water dance. They're establishing a hierarchy. The bigger the male, the more impressive the display. 
when it comes to mating, the females will know who to pick. For much of the year, the caiman hunt under cover of darkness. But now, with prey stranded in increasingly shallow water, fishing is easy. As the sun rises, the caiman come out to bask. They must raise their body temperature to 30 degrees to better digest their breakfast. As many as 35 million caiman lurk here, in densities of up to 150 per square kilometer, the biggest concentration of reptiles on the planet. The Pantanal would seem to be a Cayman paradise, but the temperature soon soars to over 40 degrees, and biting flies find chinks in the reptile's armor. The insects force them to retreat. The warming water in the Pantanal's pools gradually gives up its oxygen, leaving trapped fish desperate for breath. Birds fly in from far and wide to join the feast. Woodstalks, working in teams, probe for prey with beaks and feet. Jabiru storks work alone, using sight as well as touch to double their chances. They care little about passing caiman. They just need to catch as many fish as possible. At this time of year, they'll work as long as there's light to fish by, as they've got a nest full of giant chicks to feed. Jabiru's coincide their breeding with this seasonal bounty. Usually they'll rear just two chicks. Four signals a particularly dry year. It's a big commitment for the hard-working parents. Four months after the last serious rain, the Pantanal is still releasing water into a network of mighty rivers. The largest of these survive even the driest months of the year, creating an ever-reliable reservoir of food as well as water. Few people live permanently in the Pantanal, Along with the cowboys, there are small communities of fishermen who ply the rivers year-round. Gonzaga is setting out in search of monsters. These rivers hold giants in their depths. But catching them is no easy feat. The Pantanal is a haven for one of Gonzaga's biggest rivals, the giant river otter. Nearly two meters long and weighing over 30 kilos, it fully merits its name. Unlike most otters, giant otters live in groups and hunt in packs, earning their nickname, river wolves. 
In open water, their targets have room to maneuver. Even working together, the otters miss more than they hit. But closer to the water hyacinth at the river's edge, the otters soon get lucky. They may hunt together, but they eat alone. They're voracious feeders, devouring up to five kilos a day. Anything from fish and birds to anacondas and even caiman. Gonzaga, too, is homing in on the water hyacinths. He's careful to stay away from the riverbank. When he was younger, Gonzaga watched as his brother was attacked by a hungry jaguar. He was lucky to escape with his life. Gonzaga works fast, soon filling his boat with lungfish and other species. But they're just bait for the giant he's after. The fishing party, the dominant male and last year's young, returns to the den, the focus of otter family life. The breeding female is standing guard, looking after this year's cubs. She's worried for their safety and decides it's time to move home. Unable to swim, the young cubs must be dragged into the muddy waters. Predators lurk nearby. The older siblings decide the caiman are too close for comfort. Coordinated lunges are enough to see off the dangerous foe. Their nemesis dispatched, the whole family turns its attention back to the move, carrying the cubs one by one. They've already excavated a new den. Moving in doesn't take long. Responsibility over, and fueled by a belly full of fish, it's time to play. The game of tag is disrupted by yet more food. A meter long swamp eel is quite a feast. Giant river otters have long been hunted for their fur and as competition for fishermen. By the mid 20th century, 3,000 a year were being killed in Brazil. Today, there could be just a thousand left across all of South America. Here in the Pantanal, they're bouncing back. This remote swamp is one of their last refuges. As the dry season nears its peak, yellow rumped caciques are in the mood to mate. A female has arrived at the colony. An eager male has secured a prominent position to dazzle her with his talents. Each colony boasts a unique mix of up to seven songs. The male must belt out each of the female's favorites. 
to win this fiercely contested treetop talent show. The winner takes it all, mating with up to 30 partners. No prizes for coming second. The Pantanal's overgrown riverbanks are perfect for jaguars. Water to drink, shade from the sun, and a platform from which to spy prey. Almost perfect, but there's no respite and the wretched flies. These narrow riverside forests make up just 2% of the Pantanal, but they're hugely important. They're natural highways, making the Pantanal a melting pot of South American wildlife. Tufted capuchins have used these corridors to spread south from the Amazon. They live in small family groups, led by a dominant male. Fifty percent larger than the females, he calls the shots around here. The capuchins are so wary of eagles, that even a harmless vulture sends them scurrying down from the canopy. There's a strict hierarchy within the group. A submissive grimace should keep this one's superiors happy. Once the politics are sorted out, it's back to foraging. Capuchins eat anything that moves, and much that doesn't. The most productive areas are along the riverbank. But wary of caiman, the diminutive monkeys dare not venture too close to the edge. Though pickings are slim at this time of year, the tufted capuchin's versatility and these ribbon-like forests have made them the most widespread monkeys in South America. Capybaras, at up to 75 kilograms, the world's largest rodents, have a more considered approach to life. They spend the hottest part of the day lazing on the riverbanks. Though they seem immune to caiman, they're at the top of the jaguar's menu. <laughs> at the first sign of danger, the capybaras know just what to do. The river is the perfect emergency exit. With dark feathers soaking up the heat of the midday sun, black vultures are in desperate need of a dip. The sweltering scavengers have an innate fear of the river and anything in it. 
but birds don't have sweat glands. So the searing heat forces them to take the plunge. Once they've chilled out and dried off, the vultures will be ready to take to the thermals once more. Gonzaga has waited until dusk to set his hooks. Any earlier, and piranhas would demolish his bait. He'll come back before the moon rises and the piranhas return. tiger catfish. They can grow to a monstrous 25 kilograms. This is just a youngster. Fishing has sustained people here for longer than anyone can remember. Around 8,000 years ago, Bands of Native Americans first arrived in the Pantanal. Today, few native communities remain, most wiped out by the diseases and weapons of European conquistadors. But the fringes of the Pantanal are the last stronghold of the Bororo. Only a thousand are left. The Bororo may have embraced modern clothing, but they still hold on to their most important traditions. Brudwi, an elder from the village of Santa Teresa, leads the fishing team. It's a two-day process and starts with harvesting palm fronds. Getting the right length and strength is crucial. The Barora method is a finely tuned technique. Once they've gathered the raw materials, the men take it in turns to weave a giant sieve. Next, they build the dam. The villagers have chosen the location carefully. This tributary hasn't been fished in over a year. The elders are intent on getting every detail just right. Sons and grandsons look on, soaking up the traditions of their forefathers. Skills like these are what make them Bororo. Building the dam takes all day. They won't finish it until the morning. appeal to the spirits to bring them luck. They can only fish this way in the dry season. They know the weather will break within weeks. The clues are in the night sky. The positions of constellations signal that the rains are coming.
day two of the Barora fishing trip. While the older men put the finishing touches to the dam, the youngsters gather upstream. They've collected vines, which the Barora call timbo. The name means poison. Men, women and children must extract its active ingredient and flush it downstream. So they pound the vines to a pulp. The poison, known by scientists as rotanone, prevents fish from taking up oxygen. They become dizzy, and the young Bororo are poised to pounce. The confused fish go with the flow and are ushered on their way downstream. The front of poison water moves inexorably towards the dam. The village elders wait patiently for the hard-earned catch to arrive. It takes five hours for the first weakened fish to be sucked into the trap. Brudwi and Ayepa, the village chief, are set to sweep in any strugglers. Within minutes, more bigger fish arrive. Tasty Piriputanga and Dorado amongst them. Soon more hands are needed to pin down the slippery catch. Within an hour, over a hundred fish have been caught. The poison is harmless to humans and will soon break down in the river. The Barora will be feasting tonight. And they're not the only ones. A hungry jaguar can operate in almost total darkness. Its saucer-like eyes use just a sixth of the light required by humans. Cows, too, have great night vision, inherited from wild ancestors. But they have neither the speed nor the agility to escape South America's top predator. Drawn to one of the few remaining pools, this cow would have made an easy target. Black vultures can spot a carcass from several kilometers away. Where one homes in, the rest follow. The jaguars try to stash her feast away from prying eyes. But her efforts are in vain. The carcass could last several days, but only if she can keep the competition at bay. Her need is greater than normal. Two hungry cubs are depending on her. Jaguars take the blame for most cattle deaths in the Pantanal, even though drought and disease kill four times as many. As a result, jaguars have been hunted for centuries. Even though killing them is now illegal, most ranchers still won't tolerate the big cats on their land.
By October, the Pantanal's residents are increasingly desperate for water. Coates, close relatives of raccoons. Females live in large bands and spend 90% of their waking hours looking for food. They seek out the shrinking pools where they can probe soft mud with sensitive snouts. But the simple act of drinking is a nerve-wracking affair. Any pool in the Pantanal is bound to hold a caiman or two. Some take courage from their friends. Others are less certain. In the end, thirst overcomes caution. By November, the dry season is at its peak. Stranded fish are doomed. Families of caiman abandon the disappearing pools. They travel up to nine kilometers in search of water. Those that don't find the rivers won't see out the dry season. Even the capybaras forsake their territories and gang together, looking for food. Daily temperatures soar towards 50 degrees in the shade. For some, it's too much. For nature's undertakers, the height of the dry season is a time of plenty. In December, the weather breaks. The desiccated landscape is about to undergo an incredible transformation. Over the next six months, a meter of rain will fall on the Pantanal. But the water level will rise by up to five meters, thanks to the huge volume of water flowing in from the north. The rivers soon burst their banks. As the floods take over, pools and lakes join together, and surviving fish are released from their confinement. Many of the Pantanal's 400 or so species head upstream to traditional breeding grounds in a migration known as the Pirikema. Deeper, faster water makes life harder for the fish eaters. The cowboys corral their herds to higher ground. The parched land soaks up huge quantities of water. But within weeks, the ground is saturated and 80% is flooded. For the next few months, the Pantanal is abandoned to its wild inhabitants. The Pantanal that has been so dry is transformed into a water world once more. Its swollen rivers funnel south, joining the Paraguay River, then merge with the Paraná, the second longest river in South America. Together they drain a fifth of the entire continent. 
One of the tributaries passes through Foz de Iguazu. The mightiest waterfalls in the Americas. Shaped like a giant horseshoe, there are a series of 275 falls, dropping 80 meters into a narrow chasm. Nearly three kilometers across, the Iguazu Falls are wider than the Victoria Falls and dwarf Niagara. In the wet season, up to 12,800 cubic meters flow over the edge every second. 18,000 Olympic swimming pools every hour. Huge flocks of great dusky swifts swirl through the mist. They've come to breed. But they have a problem. The lush forests that cloak the falls are full of thieves. Toucans, specialist nest raiders. And quartis. They'll eat anything they can find. But eggs are a particularly valuable prize. Bands patrol every level of the forest. The swifts have come up with an extraordinary solution. As dusk descends, they fly ever closer to the falls, looking for a chance to penetrate the thundering curtain of water. Once they've made it to the slippery cliff face, their long claws enable them to cling on. Then they clamber towards their nests, precious eggs, safely deposited out of danger's reach. All of the rivers from the Pantanal eventually flow into the Rio Plata, creating the second largest river basin on Earth. The Pantanal plays a crucial role in controlling this massive volume of water, acting like a giant sponge. During the wet season, it works as a natural break, preventing flash floods from hitting southern Brazil, Paraguay and Argentina. And during the dry, it becomes a vital reservoir, slowly releasing its contents. The Pantanal's riches have drawn people and animals from far and wide. Rare species have found refuge and splendid isolation for much of the year. Many have flourished, finding ways to thrive despite the annual cycle of boom and bust. Humans, too, have learned to exploit the Pantanal's resources. But they've never tamed this wild frontier. And permanent settlement is largely impossible. The climate's extremes have kept people at bay, leading to a natural abundance unparalleled on the continent.
And it's not just numbers. The Pantanal's complex mix of swamps, forests, grasslands and waterways provides homes for an incredible diversity of animals. The result is a wild haven at the heart of South America.